Awesome. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Have It All podcast. So we have a triumvirate here. Cool. Guy's actually going to be here on the conversation with us. What's up, bro? What's up, buddy? Good to be here. And, and uh, I'm really, really excited for this conversation. Um, just so you guys know, I don't know if I've shared this with you, but uh, I always do pre-interview conversations with people um, just to kind of get a sense of, A, if they're fit for the show, but more importantly, what can we talk about and things like that. And every once in a while, I come across someone, I'm like, ooh, this is going to be good. And uh, Jake Eagle is here. Those are, those are the ones I get invited on, by the way. <laughs> those are exactly. That's how you know, if I'm here, that's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually very true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, guys, like, so what are we doing today? I was like, we're going to have an awesome conversation. I'm like, I'll be there. So, uh, Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be with both of you. I uh, had a brief conversation with Elon probably maybe two weeks ago, and yep. we really we really clicked. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it was funny. So you you said something, and I, I want you to actually introduce yourself. Uh, but you said something really interesting in that conversation about your most recent uh, inner quest in her journey of sorts. And I was like, oh, yes, let's do that. So uh, before we dive into all that amazingness, why don't you just tell people a little bit about yourself and what you're up to in life? Great. So my wife, Hannah, and I moved here just about a year ago. We came here last May. We had been in Santa Fe before that. I was a licensed psychotherapist in practice for 25 years. Loved the work. I'm passionate about it. 15 years ago, we started teaching retreats around the world, and it was all good. Um, and I have uh, no regrets, but when we moved here, I had an epiphany that has altered my perspective on doing therapy. And so now I actually think of myself, a a actually, I was thinking of myself as a meta therapist like what do people do after they've done a lot of therapy and they haven't gotten what they wanted mm. this morning i was writing an article and i referred to myself as an anti-therapist which is probably a little overstated but i'm definitely questioning the whole world of therapy and self-help right now wow and why is that what was the what was the aha moment hmm. Well, the, the the epiphany only happened i think because we moved so when we left Santa Fe, we had, we had a great support system. We had a beautiful home. We were making a nice living. Life was great. But there was something that was missing, and I couldn't tell you what it was. We, we came here two years ago for a month. We came to Hawaii, and we both felt 20 years younger, and we felt mm -hmm. this vitality, and we said, this is how we should feel all the time. Mm -hmm. Let's move to Hawaii. So we did. We went home, sold the house, moved to Hawaii. We get here, and we know no one. Um, we're not making any money and I'm kind of scratching my head going, Hmm, maybe I needed all those accolades. Maybe I needed all those people who appreciated me and what's the deal. I mean, I'm not feeling so good. And for the first six months, I really struggled. I was very disoriented. We had no, no reputation, no community, no anything. And one morning I woke up. I'm looking at my life. I'm living in Hawaii. We're building our dream house. I'm looking at Hannah. She's getting dressed. And I say to myself, am I thrilled to be alive? Because I should be. Mm. But the answer was no, I'm not. I'm unhappy. And it's crazy that I would be unhappy. So I decided that I was not going to do what I have done for my whole life, which was dig in, start thinking, processing my feelings, maybe go out, put on a workshop. I decided I was going to just be with this experience and approach my life in a different way. And what it ended up being was that question, am I thrilled to be alive? Mm -hmm. And all the time I started looking around going, I really should be thrilled. I should be ecstatic. I'm pretty healthy for a 62 year old guy. I got this great wife, I've got a beautiful place. We're in Hawaii. We're not making a bunch of money, but we're fine. Mm -hmm. So I started asking people, I started saying to people, are you thrilled to be alive? And I did this with a colleague of mine who has a great life. And he said, I'm content, I'm pleased, but I'm not thrilled. And nobody answered the question. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Mm -hmm. And, and what it did is it brought to my awareness that we lack gratitude. Mm. And then I developed this model that 
the, the short version, we can go into more detail, detail, but the short version is that therapy and self-help work, I think is all focused on what I call safety consciousness. It's all about being productive, about measuring ourselves, about comparing ourselves, about, yep. right? And it's good stuff. It's fine for a few years, maybe. But when we're doing it for decades, I think what happens is we get caught in a loop and we just get better and better at safety, which is very heady stuff. Mm -hmm. But we're not really, we're not really in our hearts. Mm. We're not feeling gratitude. We're not feeling appreciation. And I mean appreciation at the most basic level, like the fact that we're alive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or can speak. Yeah. Can speak, yep. can make choices. I mean, really fundamental stuff. And so my work shifted pretty radically and I started doing these free groups with people online using Zoom, get groups of 10 people, they would pair up. And the whole focus was getting people to recognize basically how fortunate they are. Mm. And here's the fascinating thing. When I shift from what I call safety consciousness to heart consciousness, most of my problems look pretty small. Yes. Right? Yeah, so Ron, you understand, now you understand why I brought yeah, you on here. I thought, I thought that like six different times all here. So I'm like, oh, that's why we're here. And that's why we're here. And that's why we're here. And that's why we're here. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. If, eloquent timing. You know, I, I, I think when you work with a lot of people, uh, as we do, and it sounds like you do as well, what I find is like everyone's kind of going through the same rhythms together. It's like the same breakdowns, the same transformations. So it's like a very interesting timing that we're talking to you. Uh, just last week, we were on a coaching call and something we've been kind of just exploring as a group is what life looks like free of achievement. What does it look like when, when life is not about that? I, when someone first posed the question, I couldn't even think of a reason to get out of bed without something to achieve today. And it, it perplexed my mind because I saw how much of a society we had become about achieving something. So we're, we were on a, on a call last week and someone was talking about goals and I realized this was the first year since we've had a business, certainly in my life that I don't have a goal this year. I, I have no goals. I have no goals as a business. I know how I want to feel like you said, right? <laughs> this elation, this like this excitement about life. And I thought what's between me and that feeling consistently and where most personal development, like you said, is like we're landmark education people. It's 10 years of how to be the most productive human being on the planet earth. Right. And I, and while I could say like, I became really productive and the things I produced possibly could be correlated to giving me joy at the end of the day, it doesn't like source joy. So all of that stuff. And if you look at business developmental things, everything is about raising the bar, raise the bar, raise the bar, raise the bar. And it's like, okay, well, then I'm always still going after achievement and, and let don't tell me last week. I'm like, forget raising the bar. I want to lower this thing like big time, lower it to the ground where when I wake up in the morning, I go like this. I'm like, Ooh, today's going to be a good day. Cause I'm breathing or my feet touch the ground and I can start walking around where other people can't. And I can be appreciative of that. And really just, you know, when, when people say you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, no one ever says you wake up on the right side of the bed. Yeah. And, and you're waking up, if you can wake up into exactly, I think what you're alluding to is these little things of appreciation. Like I'm getting to have this amazing experience. Even if it's sad today, be grateful that your biomechanical suit gives you the ability to experience whatever this thing we're calling sadness is. And if you can start with that small level of appreciation, like I can breathe, I can walk. We all know this. You feel good, good things happen. You feel bad, bad things happen. So you might as well start with the really lowly stuff that most people are not appreciating and taking for granted. And, and uh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. The, the fascinating part about this for me is that if we believe that, then when we join people in conversations about what's wrong or what more they need to do or how they have to set the bar higher, I think what we're doing is we are validating that reality. Totally. And so as a therapist, part of why I said I'm, either an anti-therapist or a meta-therapist is, I don't want to validate that reality anymore. Yes. I don't want to participate in that conversation. That's yeah. amazing. There's something so beautiful, you know, and I was saying this to you on our, our previous conversation, that as coaches or therapists or anything, I think we're on the journey just like our clients. It's interesting to me 
that both of us have kind of come to similar places in our lives. I just, I want to honor, because I absolutely love the question, are you thrilled? And I want you to know that I will be borrowing it in the future for, for different things, because it really is brilliant and it really gets someone focused and centered. I guess my question is, do you have a sense of, of what happened? Because as I hear it, it's like, look, there's these conversations that different people get to have at different, I'll call them vibrational frequencies, okay? Yeah. We've all had the same conversations that you were talking about, you know, when we were validating people's experience and achievement and all these things that we we're just throwing out here. Is it as simple as, as you do the inner work, you raise your vibrational frequency where we now, those conversation no longer serve and then we're getting access to different conversations. How do you see this whole thing unfolding for yourself, for clients? I, I don't think it is that simple. I think that people can have the old conversation forever. They can incrementally improve, but I see there's a ceiling and we don't break through that ceiling. That's all the work we can do in safety consciousness. We don't break through that unless there's something in our lives that flips us into a different perspective. For me, it was coming here and having my life kind of, it didn't fall apart, but I felt like it had fallen apart. Mm -hmm. And for me, the contrast was so radical because if anybody looked, they'd go, you lucky son of a gun. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, okay, my life looks fantastic and I'm unhappy. How am I doing that? That's really wild. Right. I, would love, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about safety consciousness. I think that's a, it's a really great terminology. What comes up for me when I hear it, and at least with our experience and you know, 15 years of working with people, is that um, understanding alone, like mental understanding, conscious understanding, while it's a useful tool, it's, it's more like dealing with symptoms than offering a cure. And uh, I certainly, with all the work that I've done, I, I can say, I can measure incrementally where things have gotten better. And there's something like a trigger coming that's going to just bring up all my old stuff, like, again, and take away all that safety or, you know, the illusion of taking away that safety um, from my perception. And then the last few years, and, and I don't know that you don't mean it this way, I just want you to define it for, for the audience, like how you mean it. Um, we've just done deep dives into the body to like, just, just feeling through everything, all emotional, being grateful for everything, acceptance of all things, really like the Buddhist moniker, right? Like we accept all things. So sadness, anger, it's all part of it. The funny part is as we've accepted these things in ourselves, uh, allowed them to be felt through in our as lived experience, they have lost their power, which no matter how many mental exercises I did in the past had them lose their power. So that's kind of, you know, our aim right now is to kind of, invite people to really start feeling again. Um, so I just want to kind of get your take on, on safety consciousness. What does that work look like? And, and how would you define it? So it looks like doing all the things that we do to make ourselves feel secure, to think that we have found ways to cope with the uncertainty of the world mm -hmm. so that we can deny it. Um, also to avoid any feelings or awareness we have about our own mortality. And it's all based in time. It, it, it's, a, it's an orientation to life that is measured in time. When, when we shift into hard or what I call spacious consciousness, another level, it actually becomes timeless. And when, we go, when I go to spaciousness, words are actually sort of irrelevant. There's no place for them. Yeah. And on the way there, I agree with you that the experience becomes more of a bodily experience, more of an integrated experience. However, a lot of therapies are encouraging people to experience sensation in their body, but I believe the mistake they make is they go from the experience in the body to then telling a story about it. Hmm. So and true. so the distinction I make now is between primary feelings and secondary feelings. Primary mm -hmm. feelings are really, as far as we know, there are four of them. There's anger, sadness, fear, and joy. I can have those sensations in my body in the last about 90 seconds. That's it. That's yep. the chemical life of a feeling. Now, if I tell a story, 
then those feelings turn into abandonment, tension, vulnerability, resentment, boredom, hostility, all sorts of things. Those have a life of decades because as soon as I start telling the story, I just keep filling those chemicals, pouring them into my system. And, and what I want to do is encourage people to do the work they need to do in safety consciousness because we do need to do some work sure. there. Sure. And then say enough is enough. Enough is enough. That's the title of my next book. Enough is enough. <laughs> enough processing feelings. I, I had a fight with my wife, Hannah, about five, six years ago. And we've always been very respectful and we treat each other well. So our fights are not terribly intense. But we're having this fight and I look at this woman and I say, enough is enough. I never am going to have this fight again. I'm never going to be disrespectful to her again. Why, why would I do that to my best friend, to someone I love? Mm. And I stopped. I just stopped because I stopped giving myself permission to behave in those ways. And a lot of this is about what we tolerate. We, we all get whatever we settle for. Certainly. As a society, right? There's a, a silent agreement. Don't call me out on my stuff. I won't call you out on yours. Right. Well, and, and, yeah, and, in, yeah. and in relationships too. I mean, it's, it's amazing to have a relationship where someone's willing to say like, Hey, I'm, and here's the line that I think is just a massive takeaway for people. I'm not giving myself permission to treat my wife that way again. Yeah. And we do, we, it, it's yeah. so funny how we treat our loved ones the worst mm -hmm. because we know we can get away with it and they'll still be around. Like the things that you do to a spouse or your kids or a sibling or a parent or something like that, you would never do to say someone that you met on the street or a boss or anything like that. It's just really interesting that we let ourselves go there. And I think that's really profound. Like I'm no longer giving myself permission. There was a, one of our mentors a long, long time ago told us the story of a, a couple who the uh, husband's game in life was he had an agreement that he would always uh, uh, say he's sorry first. And I remember hearing it and be like, well, that's dumb. You know, you, what about all the times that they're wrong? Right. And, and he just goes on to say, you could either be right or you can be in love. You can't be both. And I chose love every single time. And I, I remember I was young. I was 21 years old at the time. And it was, mind-blowing to me <laughs> and now being this year will be my 10-year anniversary um i it, it's some of the best advice i've ever been given and mm, yeah, it wasn't even, yeah it wasn't even given to me like directly in that way that's beautiful i get it i remember i remember when i met hannah and she said to me this bizarre thing she said love can be easy and i was like what does that mean you know, and, and now it's absolutely a mantra. And our belief is that love absolutely can be easy. Yeah. Relationships don't have to be hard work. Yeah. Well, that, that's our mantra on life right now. Life is easy. And it's, it's also the same, the same way that you probably heard love is easy as like a, what? You know, you say to someone, life is easy. And they're just like, what are you talking? Do you want me to show you the things that I've been going through? Yeah. And uh, similar to you, in that shift from, you know, your question was, am I thrilled in life? Um, ours was this exploration of all of these beliefs that we've had about how life is, about how we are in life, about how we are in relationships, about how we are in our, like to our body, in our body, about how I am with my kids, to our parents. And there's something that's interesting. Like we make up a lot of stuff and forget that we made it up. And then our world gets painted a very specific way. And we've just been in this exploration. Like what if we threw all that stuff out? Not as if it's bad, but just kind of threw it all out. And we're like, okay, let's play with some different statements. Like life is easy. Making money is easy. I get to have a healthy fit body with ease and grace. You know, things like that. You just... A, you don't hear out there. And B, even when you start saying it to yourself, at first you're like, do I really believe that? Yeah, yeah. That, that sounds a little weird. Uh -huh. And I can tell you this probably started, what, bro, like 18 months ago? 
Uh, I would say, yeah, I'd say like maybe like in the more beginner sense, I would say two, two and a half years and kind of like a more felt to wear sense, probably 18 months. Yeah. And Life changing. it's, it's, it's to a level where every day I'm, I guess I'm not as surprised as I used to be. And I'm yet still surprised if, if that makes sense yeah. at how easy and effortlessly you just get to receive stuff by just being. <laughs> not, not this insane focus. I got to run faster. I got to do more. I got to get there. I got to like, we've dropped all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The, the expression I've used in the last year is I have replaced force with presence. Mm, so beautiful. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. So in, instead of efforting and trying all the time, it's about presence. Yeah. And, and the reason what you just said resonates for me is because of another very simple idea, which is that nothing means anything other than the meaning we give it. Mm -hmm. So true. Right. Now I, I get concerned sometimes that this gets a little bit convoluted when people start using affirmations, right? So somebody's really overweight, they look in the mirror and they go, I'm thin and I'm beautiful. Sure. Yep. That concerns me. I don't think same, that's same. what we're talking about. Same. Yeah, yeah. It concerns me because from a biological perspective, if if the subconscious is not in agreement with what's being said, and this is why we stop goal setting, um, you're creating it's creating stress, overwhelm in the system that's activating automated patterns, and they go right back into what they've done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a physiological incongruence when I look in the mirror, I'm 100 pounds overweight, and I say I'm thin and beautiful. Sure. Yep. Sure. Yeah. You can say things like I, I, you know, I live a healthy lifestyle or like I'm, I'm working towards living a healthy lifestyle, something that's much more congruent with the right now. Right. It's like, it's fine to have for us. It's like, it's fine to have the vision a mile down the road, realize that there's many, many inches to, you know, crawl or walk before you get that mile and don't focus on the mile, focus on the inch in front. Just, yeah. just and, and, and this is interesting. So vision and inches and all of that stuff is born out of safety consciousness. Mm hmm. Say it's more. still measurement related. It's not right. bad stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're always looking to quantify specific and measurable. And it's like, uh, we can't feel some way until that specific measurable thing has been attained. And I agree with you, like where, where I think we're at these days is our, our meditation practice. Mm. And like we all live in a virtual reality world. Eyes open, eyes closed. It's, it's all pretty much made up. So, you know, Certainly with our eyes opened and, and senses alert, there is a lot more stimulus coming in that's outside of our control. But in, in a controlled environment like meditation where you close your eyes and you quiet yourself down, you're, you're kind of creating your reality. It's, a, it's a, like a non-awake state, so to speak. And in that place, you can feel whatever you want to feel. Now, if, if the response of the universe of God is in correspondence to your frequency and how you're feeling internally, then the most important thing in your life is not to achieve is to just go and feel the things that you think you're going to feel once you've made that achievement happen. Just sit with it. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're describing, bringing up meditation is really key because it goes back to Alon's question about what, what's the, what's the, what's the switch that flips. And I think meditation or something like that mm -hmm. is a key component that I have to have some experience that tells me there's a different way to be in the world. For some people, meditation is one way to get there. What yeah. are some others? I'm curious. Well, I think that um, trauma actually, interestingly, can be. Yes. Uh, depends on how you cope with it. But I've been reading Viktor Frankl recently, you know, Man's Search for Meaning, mm -hmm. and he's in the concentration camps at Auschwitz. And he talks about it just beautifully. He talks about being there and he doesn't use the word heart consciousness, but that's what he's talking about. He's in this horrific situation and he's accessing heart consciousness. And he's essentially saying, if I can do this here, what does that say about humanity? What, what is possible? So I think that through a traumatic experience, if we survive, we can come out the other side in a completely different place. Yep. And certainly we see that with cancer patients and terminally yes. ill people yeah. on the regular. So we, we know that that is the case. Um, so when you say hard consciousness, you know, one of the things we've been talking a lot about, and I just want to see if it kind of fits that frame, um, for us, when I look at the world, uh, a, a very masculine world, right? Patriarchal world, 
um, a lot of the conversations that we've grown up around is all about resiliency. Hmm. Everything is just like we're New Yorkers, right? It's the city of resiliency. You can make it here. You can make it anywhere. So another way is how resilient can you be? Uh, you go on the subway and it looks like um, a competition for who's got a harder life, essentially. And it and it's just, and it you can literally see people vibrating it out. Like mine is harder than yours. Mine and is they harder wear it on their face so well. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just like this look of like I've been so beat more than you. And there's like pride behind that as a New Yorker about like how much shit you've gone through. And then the last two years, certainly focusing as a man, which I wouldn't have even known to focus until it got brought to my attention, was like harmonizing the feminine, you know, energy field with my body. And then suddenly life became about, well, how much pleasure can I receive? Not how much resiliency can I have? And a lot of what we talk about today is really how, how as a society, as a whole, do we make the turn into having those conversations. I don't know that that's the end all be all, but certainly I rather live in a world where kids are born into like how much pleasure do you want to have versus how resilient are you going to be? Right? Like boys don't cry. It's a resiliency, resiliency conversation. So that's just what I hear when you, when you say the hard space, but I would love to have you just articulate it and for people, whatever way comes out for you. Well, I think that it fits nicely with what you're talking about. I love the idea of pleasure versus resiliency. Um, when I talk about heart space, sometimes people get confused. They, they associate it with some kind of a romantic heart. Exactly. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about waking up and being in a state of gratitude and appreciation and love that's not dependent on another person. Mm -hmm. It resides within me. It's my ability to see beauty. It's my ability to connect with people in a way where I either move myself or maybe the other person moves him or herself. Mm. We're, we're touched by our own humanity. This is available to us all the time, L literally all the time, mm -hmm. except for those moments when a tiger is chasing us, mm -hmm. those rare moments. Other than that, the state, this quality is available to us, but nobody tells us that. Sure. Interesting. You say that because most of us are living our life like the tiger's constantly chasing us absolutely and, and and i think again you can correct me if i'm wrong as some you know a person who's who's got the cert certificates um after the name is that my understanding is the stress response in the body is designed to be acute ours is just a prolonged and ongoing we've literally built a society that constantly keeps us in a stress response and it's actually what's driving a lot of you know unwell being on the planet because our body's just not built to cope with stress constantly. Yeah, it's actually what you're touching on is a mistake, I think, in evolution, which is that our body, our primitive brain, the amygdala, is designed to protect the body. And it's great at it. What's happened is as we've evolved, we're no longer trying to protect our body, we're trying to protect what I call my identity. Yes. Some people call it ego. Ego has kind of a bad rap, which I think is unfortunate, so I yep. call it identity. It's my story. It's my idea about who I am. And if one of you guys challenges my idea about who I am, I'm likely to respond like a tiger's coming at me, which is totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Because all you're doing is challenging something that's made up, and it's malleable. It will evolve. It will grow. It can't really be killed or hurt unless I think it can be. Beautiful. So I want to really loosen my attachment to my identity. Be, be open, be, be able to question who I am, what I'm doing, what my life means. Well, that's brilliant. And I think as a, as a fundamental uh, way of helping us grow up in a new way, that would be like a pr one of the primary functions of like, it doesn't have to be this solid thing. You don't have to know who you are. Even that idea of who are you? Go figure out who you are. It's basically saying, take yourself into a solid state. Like convince yourself that you're this one way and then certainly in a situation like you had with your wife where you're creating some kind of situation that's not giving you pleasure or them pleasure, um, you don't have the ability to say, I'm not going to do this anymore. Because the identity is right there going, yeah, you are. Because if it's not malleable, of course, you're going to continue to do it. However, if you can get yourself into a space like Elon kind of said before, where the identity, the identity is all about being right, right about who you are, right about the way that the world is, right about the way the government is, right? It, like every problem we have in government today is just everyone trying to be right about the way it's supposed to be. However, when you can give that up and you really aren't identified with anything, you know, even for us, like the last few months have, have been in a conversation of how do we unattach from this brand 
And I don't mean like give up the brand, but I mean like stop having it be part of our identity where we really start treating it like it's just an idea. It's not who we are. It's not what we do. It's none of that. It's just a moniker, like kind of a flag would be like, hey, this is where transformation happens. But certainly I'm not Tory Prime. Elon's not that either. And again, not, not with the needing of not even having to know what the answer to that is. Just being in a state of curiosity changes everything. It's incredible how much that can do. Most um, people, like you said, the, the, the response is safety, right, to the identity. So the identity needs answers all the time versus just remaining in the state of curiosity. For me, um, this pleasure you're talking about, this excitement, this like low bar all comes from I'm just curious all day long. I don't need to know. You said, yeah. you said this thing at, when you started speaking about evolution that kind of like perked my ears. And I was like, is it? I, I'm just curious. So you said, you know, there's a mistake in evolution. And you were talking about how obviously the amygdala functions in a way that, you know, was really meant for primitive men, like, like pure survival mechanism. And I, and I really think that's what you meant. You know, what, what popped up from my mind is like, well, everything in, in, as far as I can see, you know, and I'm obsessed with nature shows. You live in like one of the most nature filled, amazing places mm -hmm. in the world. Like everything is such perfection the way everything always finds its balance and does all these things. I've always thought I I'm with you. I, I, what was it? Ryan holiday came out with that book. Ego is the enemy. And I, as soon as I read the title, I was like, Oh no. <laughs> um, even the ego, you know, the way it's designed is perfect. Uh, the way our body responds to things is perfect. As you were saying that what occurred to me and what came through was like, isn't it interesting that we're, I think we would all agree, the three of us and probably those listening, that like something's happening. There's like a spiritual awakening, conscious awakening happening all across the planet, right? Like it, this, the speed at which this information is being received and asked for is, is eons where it was 10 years ago, right? So <laughs> the thought that came through is like, isn't it funny we got dealt this brain, we got dealt this body, we got dealt this system. Now we're being put in this scenario where we're finding truly the limitations of the system. It's almost like someone wrote the program, the computer program, and for the first time in history of humanity, we're coming up against like, you know, the glass wall, the glass ceiling of it. And it's interesting because I think that's what's leading to these incredible conversations. I'm not saying that it wasn't around, you know, Jesus was here and Buddha was here. They were all having these kind of amazing conversations. Now just the receptivity, like the world is so loud. It's, I don't know if violence, the word I would use, it's just loud, right? And like people are looking to find how to, to your point, find the love, the acceptance, the peace in here, because they're sure as hell not finding it out there. Yeah, it's true. And I, I like listening to you and I inspire myself with both you guys because you're, you're, you're younger than I am and, and you've got this stuff in your bones, which is fabulous. Um, I may be a little bit more jaded. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to turn the ship in time. Well, uh, so let's, so let's look, even look at that in a positive sense, right? Well, I'll say these things, right? That, Jake, the fact someone your age is still doing the work, growing, right? And, and sure, you say, I'm jaded, but that's like saying my identity, saying I'm jaded, versus there's parts of my system that are still anchored to certain beliefs, right? And that programming has just been in there longer. If it's been in there longer, it's harder to uncover, or it tends to be harder to uncover. However, we did say that people who get sick terminally ill are often the ones that have the monumental breakthroughs that often become some of the most spiritual people on the planet. And yet as a society, if we look around, we're a little bit operating like a cancer, treating the planet like it's a dumping ground and it, it's becoming terminally ill, so to speak. And yet we know that when things get shadowy is also the opportunity for, um, for light. You had mentioned about going spatial and different states of consciousness and realms and all this stuff is being mapped really, really, really well. So I want to give you just something that made me excited. I don't know if you've ever read Ken Wilber. Yeah. And he's, and he's got the uh, religions of tomorrow and he has a whole thing in there about when people go integral 
and that at 2015, I have no idea how they measure this, but I tip my hat to Ken Wilber and all his genius and everything he's experienced, so I'll, I'll take his word for it at this point in time, is that 5% of the world's population is already living in that state, that heart integral state um, that you mentioned, and that as they look through history, in moments where renaissance happened or mass shifts in society happened, it begins with 10% of the population owning a new state of consciousness. And then the massive shift happens. And they have estimated that within the next 10 years from when that book was written, that's going to happen. So by 2025, we could see an absolutely massive shift in society. And I think, I think we are seeing structures break. A lot of people look at the Donald Trump's and the conservative movements that are happening all over the planet, but it's like the dying breath of an animal that can't survive anymore. And it's like trying to claw its way and, and replicate itself, right, as quickly as it can, just like any cell in the body would when it's becoming cancerous. So for me, when I look, I, like, do I love the man? No, I don't love the man, but I can, I can see beyond like the spiritual purpose. And I, I'm actually like, this is good. Like you see people taking responsibility everywhere. When, when have you seen, seen 17 year old kids running through the streets going like, no more, like we don't give a shit, right? That this is new. So we are seeing a lot of amazing things, philanthropic things happening, things with the currency markets happening. So for me, it's like, you know, when people say is the shift happening, it's not going to, it potentially could have a mass moment in time where like some mass consciousness happens, but there's going to be a workup to it. And the workup seems to be happening. Well, two, two comments. One, I like your story better than mine. So I'll take <laughs> that. <laughs> free. And the second thing is a, an example of what you were doing. So you were, uh, you were pacing my comments about maybe I'm a little jaded and you were essentially my, my sense is you're essentially giving me a little permission, given my age, given my history, given my scripts. And that's that thing about going along with people in a conversation that I think is not productive. So I appreciate it and it felt good, mm -hmm. but I think it's more effective to say, you know what? You don't have to be jaded. Mm. You don't have to be. You've been telling us you're living in Hawaii. You got this great wife. You got, hey, man, knock it off. Yeah, stop it. And, yeah, really. Did you ever see the Bob Newhart stop oh, it? I know. That's why that's I said it. <laughs> stop it. I love it. And, and I think that is an old conversation. Like, I catch my dad doing that now. He says things like, I'm a dinosaur. I don't, I don't understand these things anymore. You know, but that's a choice, too. That's saying, like, okay, well, I'm removing my interest from this area. I won't grow there anymore. However, like everything's changed, right? Connectivity, you're in Hawaii. Right. We're, we're, I'm in San Diego, Elon's in New York. And age is certainly not what it was before. We don't, we don't put people out to pasture and say, okay, bye-bye. Like if you have the interest to, and, and certainly I hope that your generation actually really owns that and says, hey, we do have wisdom to share, right? You guys don't want to make some of the mistakes that we've made. We've gotten to this spiritual enlightenment period in our lives. You guys can springboard from, from here. You don't have to do all this heavy lifting and resiliency. And, and I think that's funny what's happening with these generations right now, because it's like, what does every generation want for it to be better for their kids? Then it's better for their kids. And instead of saying, great, look, we accomplished it. We say they're entitled. <laughs> it's like, no, they just don't have to survive anymore. So they're trying to figure out what to do with their time. But if we haven't had a generation that hasn't had to survive ever, this is brand new. So look, I think for each of us, these tools, this connectivity that we have today, certainly as someone your age, older, uh, can be giving gifts value all over the planet today. If the desire is there, I legitimately hope that technology just makes that easier and easier for people to do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just want to acknowledge you real quick here. And I think we, people are going to hear it and they just totally miss it. And I really want to highlight it because you just exemplified it so incredibly well. So I don't know if you guys caught it, right? Jake was sharing his story, his, his, let's call it perspective on life, right? Guy came in and shared his perspective on life. Jake in the moment, literally in the moment is sitting there going, you know what? That story is much better than mine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to live in that one. And I just think, look, everything we've been talking about, right? Like identity wants to hold on so much. You've just showed masterfully what it means to disassociate from that. How easy is it to be right about our shit? You can, you can find evidence for anything you want to believe today. You're just like, you know what? No, I, that sounds good. I'm going with that. And, and I think that's the flexibility and fluidity that we've been talking about. And I just wanted to point it out because I thought you did it so brilliant. Like it was like in a breath and it was done. And I think people are just gonna be like, 
totally missed it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you did. I want to say why I think it happens quickly when it happens quickly. I think it's because we're in a state of heart consciousness. When we're in that state of heart consciousness, we're so much more fluid and flexible. And Guy was talking earlier about the stimulus response concept. And the work of therapy used to be, and, and my work used to be, to create more space between a stimulus and a response, right? Mm-hmm. Stimulus happens, and we want to give people space so that their response is more intentional. But what I've realized in the last year is that more effective than that is the state of consciousness I'm in when the stimulus arises predetermines my response. Yes. I'm in a state of heart consciousness and, and, and guy tells a story about what I think is a better way of being in the world. And I can just feel myself moving in or taking his story in and, and, and going, yeah, this feels good. I feel good. No resistance. Yeah. If I'm in a state of safety consciousness, I would have started comparing his story to mine. Exactly. Maybe evaluating he's younger than I am, and I don't know if he really knows as much as I do, and he hasn't lived. As, and I'd be doing all of these machinations in my head, which would make me less available for the moment. Yeah, and take you out of the present moment. And what you alluded to yet earlier was like presence. I choose presence. There's something interesting, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, like inner reference, where a lot of the times everything is, let me think about it, right? And if people make their to-do list, their positives and negative, not to-do list, their positive and negative list, and the last 19 friends, and they'll post on social media, right? Like, give me outside agreement that my choice is the correct one. And where we've been playing and, and really inviting people to play in is like, well, what if you scrap that for a second? You could always go back to making lists, Right. And you started to deal with inner reference because what you were talking about from this like heart centered place, if you listen from your heart, not your ears, I know that's biologically, but like listen through your entire being, mm-hmm. not just stop it at the head and let it literally like wash over your entire body. Then your body, like for me, you know, when I meet people and Jake, this is like when we first met, I just knew, I knew we were going to have this amazing conversation because everything in my heart was like vibrating. It was just saying like, yes, right? <laughs> and that's what we've started to focus on. And it's to make it really, really simple for people. It's like, if the system, if my heart is saying yes to something, whether it's, it's someone's story, like you just were talking about, um, an inspired action that I get to take. And I'm not saying that maybe fear is not there, right? Inspired action usually has some twinge of fear because it generally takes you into something that you might not understand or know quite well, whatever. It's real simple for me. When that thing beeps yes, I go take that action. I don't have to figure out time. I don't have to figure out money. I don't have to figure out with who, nothing. Because I know all of that stuff will be shown to me as soon as I start walking. I don't need to know 97 steps. If anything is like, if I have a maybe in the body, it's a no. If I have a no in the body, it's a fuck no. So it's real simple. When this beeps yes, I move. When this beeps anything other than yes, I don't move. And in this, in this story, what you've just kind of uh, given me access to is like, we can do that in conversation too. I've always kind of had it from a place of like, this will lead to the inspired action, right? But what you just showed is you can also deal with that in, in the conversational space. And I really, really loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Bro, you're writing down something fervous. Fer, 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 uh, I was the book idea, possibly. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I, uh, yeah, so I, I love this conversation. It's so much of like what I'm working on right now. I, I feel personally, and I think this is just relates to what everyone's talking about is I've kind of identified like, you know, from the mental space, I really like calling everything the protector. Cause like I said, it's just here to protect the body, have protect the identity. So you have like the efficiency protector, you have the, this protector one, one that I've identified that works really well or, or that is working hard is the meddler, right? Always meddling. Something's happening and it meddles. Something's not working and it meddles. And when I look at my life, And I think about the times where I struggled or effort or put a lot of energy in. It's where something went wrong, went wrong in my perception. 
I had an experience that somehow uh, triggers me, overwhelms, stress, anxiety, whatever, right? And, and if you look at most people, me included, 90% of actions I've taken in my life is to relieve stress, overwhelm, and anxiety. Almost everything I do inclusively is to just change how I feel in my body. So if I change my external circumstance, I'll change how I feel internally. So this meddler, I noticed when it meddles, where I'm meddling with things, what do I end up doing? I end up working harder, fixing what I just meddled with, which means I got to effort more, put in more energy, have, deal with anxiety, stress, and all these things more and more. So I'm like, if that's what happens 99% of the time when I meddle, what does life look like when I don't? And I just kind of sit around and wait for inspiration or this next song to play or whatever you want to call it. Like Elon said, just move towards the yes. And then going back to, you know, kind of what you were saying, Jake, I, I, my, and this has been really conscious over the last three months is do not operate outside of, um, you could call it presence surely, but like just outside of your alignment, it's, it's take action. Just make sure that you're in alignment before you do, <clears throat> because otherwise the meddler is the one taking the action. And, and that's been incredible for me. And, and I think when Elon's talking about life is easy and effortless and stuff like that, it's just like, I cannot, it, 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 what makes me awe of my human experience today is how many things throughout the day happen that are inexplicable. And I could not have logically put that together. I'll give you guys a really quick example. Like <clears throat> we were just traveling for about a month. And when we were coming home, uh, my girlfriend and I decided that we were going to get uh, a car. And I don't want a new car and a new, so we're kind of like throwing around car ideas. Eventually we land on this car that my parents had, which is like this little baby Benz GLK. And I, we, and the moment we said diesel, we were both like diesel. And I, so I just knew I wanted that car. So I came home, I had no intention of buying a car. And then Sunday morning I woke up, I reached out to a few dealerships and this really effortless flow, like just get back answers. Suddenly I, before I know it, I'm applying for a loan, get like approved. And by that afternoon, I was at this dealership getting a car, like easiest car dealership experience I've ever had. Right. I was in and out in about 90 minutes for anybody who's bought a car, you know, that is record setting pace right there. <laughs> right. And our only concern about getting the car is that we're actually about to start traveling again. So it's like, it's kind of like paying for this month and then we're traveling for a month. It's like, it doesn't really make sense. So today we're, we're still closing this loan. It's, it's like almost done. Just needed a few more pieces of information. And the woman writes back to me. She goes, when do you want to make your first payment? And I said, what do you mean by that? And she goes, May 21st, June 21st, or July 21st. And I'm like, I'm sorry, come again. I'm like, you guys don't want to get paid. She goes, yeah, it's no problem. You guys can like do it up until then. Cause that's something to do with like the registration uh, of the vehicle. So I go, I go upstairs to see Mandy. I'm like, man, what was your number one concern about getting the car? She goes, I didn't want to make those two extra payments. I'm like, guess what? You don't have to. Right. And it's like, if we didn't follow the feeling, like it was just a feeling that day, then like none of that fluidity, in my opinion, would have been there. I would have, I would have gotten the price. I would have negotiated. I would have just been an upset and you know, all the different stressful, stupid things that we do. And then it's like, Oh, this is what you guys wanted you know, request received. Here you go. And I, and, and that, is not an uncommon occurrence in my life. I would say that happens at least once a day, if not a multiple times a day where I'm like, whoa, that happened. And I honestly, the only thing I can correlate it to is exactly the things that we're talking about here. Seriously. Because I've tried all the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think what you're talking about is harder. I'm going to categorize the three of us as being similar in that I think we're all pretty cerebral. Very. And so, and very verbal. And so to make this shift where we stop convincing ourselves, which we're pretty good at, instead of convincing ourselves, we start listening and paying attention to our instincts. Mm. For me, it was a huge shift. I mean, I came to Hawaii with no clear reason why it made sense, mm -hmm. but I knew it was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. The yeah. funny part is the logic mind will yeah. talk you out of it. Correct. Every all your friends probably thought you were absolutely crazy. Yep. Every client was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Was to probably me. Their response. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's, that's why I say back to the thing with the heart, like when the heart says yes, screw all the other stuff, follow it. Because that's what will lead you. Eventually you're, you would have ended up in Hawaii anyway. It just would have been a much more difficult 
roundabout way, which would have had you land there instead of like, I get to do this effortlessly. I get to just follow this. And when you got there here, and this is another thing that's really important for people to understand. We're not saying that when you follow your heart, you get rainbows and gumdrops and just love. Like, no, you right. get what's next for you in your evolutionary process, in your journey, whatever it might be. Because like to Jake's point, you got to Hawaii and it was like, oh, fuck. This is not what I thought this was going to be. This doesn't feel like what it was going to feel. And yet that led you to your, you would probably say your biggest epiphany in your entire life up until today. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's, that to me is like you, no logic mind would have gotten you to that. It was the experience of that your heart brought you to that had you be able to see that. And so I guess my question as we're kind of like uh, coming to the end of this, sadly, and Jake, by the way, if you ever want to come back on, love to have you. Cool. Um, are you thrilled? I'm totally thrilled. Amazing. I'm totally thrilled. Now, it, it, it's important to say that I've had days in the last four or five months where I haven't been. Sure. So it's been a process where I have to really check in and say, why am I not thrilled? And it always comes back to the same thing. It always comes back to some attachment to a story that I've told myself that I bought into. Mm. And I have, a, I have a buddy who he and I check in once a week and we, we call bullshit on each other. That's all we do. And he's a therapist and he's a very bright guy and we know each other pretty well. And I remember I called him about a month ago and he said, how you doing? You in heart consciousness? I said, no, but I said, I have a good reason. So don't. don't <laughs> <be my time." laughs> so he said, okay, go ahead. Take your best shot. So I said, well, I'm running a board meeting tomorrow because I'm the chairman of the board of a company. And uh, he said, yeah, so. And I said, well, it's a tough meeting. I get this happening and that happening and these players in the room. So I said, I think it's valid. And he said, man, listen to yourself. Just listen to yourself. You know you go into that meeting in hard consciousness and it is going to be so much better than if you buy into this line that it's going to be tough and there's hard characters. He said, you know better. Yep. And, and that was instead of doing therapy, it was instead of empathizing, it was instead of joining me in that conversation. And when the conversation started, I really, I was really taking myself seriously. Right. So good. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I was great. doing work with our coach uh, last week and I brought up, you know, we came back from Columbia, five days of ceremony, just in this blissed out, amazing garden of eating place. And I came back and I noticed that I was getting like my, my, and, and last year I'd come back and I was in this peaceful, like Zen. I mean, just the world could have exploded around me and I would have just been like, huh? <laughs> and meanwhile, I come back and I've just noticed that I'm, I was getting irritated by my kids fast, like fa faster than usual fast, not even faster after like that kind of journey fast. And so we have this amazing conversation and we actually spoke about this exact state, this heart open, heart consciousness state where uh, this guy, Andrew, literally lives in. He, he just lives in the state. He coaches from the state. He does everything from the state. And he has this ability where he can actually bring you to that, like his state. He can actually share that his state with you. Um, and so I'm in this state and he's like, okay, now open your eyes. And you know, I'm in this state where I'm just like deep, deep kind of like peace Zen meditation. And he's like, open your eyes. I'm like, no, I don't want to fucking open my eyes. I'm great here. And he's like, open your eyes. And I open my eyes and he's like, how do you see and how do you feel? And so I start going through this process and he goes, in that state, it doesn't matter what your kids do, the reaction won't even arise exactly. in that state. And I was yeah. like, whoa. So to your point, it's not, yes, I, I think there's absolute value in the cerebral work of, hey, this is coming at me. You know, you do the brain stuff and then the perception changes. It gives you space. You have choice. I, I think for people starting out, that's like, that's their epiphany, yeah. right? And this stuff that we're talking about, that deeper place for us, that's all it is right now. Also, it's like, 
How do we tap into that frequency in the body, in our energy field, et cetera? Because what I've experienced thus far is when in that, when in alignment, in that frequency, I just call it well-being. Like that's the word home is the other word that I've come to call it. When I'm in that frequency, my life swims it's like so effortless and easy and i experience love and things like i used to work on patience i don't even need patience because it's just all this beautiful space now like you said i my desire and want is to live in that place all the time and that hasn't been my experience yet it is obviously getting better and better i'm finding ways to stabilize and balance that, that energy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's opened my eyes to what is really possible. Yeah. Um, we have time for a couple of comments. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah. So you said, you know, when people are starting out, I think working at that level, working with their minds is important, but I think it's important for us too. And I want to give each of you an example. Please. So earlier guy said, um, when something triggers me and, and then, Ilan, you said, I was getting irritated by my kids. Yep. So yep. I encourage both of you to play with your language pattern. So instead of saying something triggered me, guy, you would say, when I triggered myself. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Right. And instead of Ilan saying, when I was getting irritated by my kids, I would say, when I was irritating myself. Yep. yep. So totally. true. And, and this is work I'm talking about that is at the level of safety. It's very tactical and cerebral and it's linguistic, which is a big part of the work we do. When we put on a training, the first half is safety consciousness to get these linguistic patterns in place. And then the second half is moving into heart consciousness. Beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I remember um, even like 15 years ago, we just, we just started getting going. And I thought to myself, you know, there, there are these conversations throughout history that really change the direction of our species, like the earth not being the center of the universe and um, flat earth versus round earth and stuff like that. And I never took the time to really think about why did people get so defensive about those shifts. And it occurred to me then that it completely changed the paradigm of what it meant to be human. If we're not the center of the universe, then we're not as divine as we nearly thought. That's a lot to deal with for people who thought that they were, right? Um, or maybe we are and we still get it wrong. We, we don't really know, or at least I can imagine and fantasize that we may not actually know. And I thought to myself, I wonder what it is that we believe today that is as big as the center of the universe and like all that kind of stuff. And what came to mind was that we still think that there's an out there. Yeah an out there experience or there's no an out there lived experience at all. It's all in here. I said, I wonder what it would take to transfer the entire planet to a, there's no out there conversation. There's just hmm. an in here. So I really appreciate um, you saying that. Cause I think that's the ultimate reminder is nothing is happening to you. <laughs> nothing is happening to you. Exactly. The, that the, 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 the mentors we had created a language called percept or perception language. And when you speak, you make clear to yourself and other people that you're only talking about your perception. You're not talking about what's going on out there. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Brilliant. Jake. So I have a question for you, Guy. Yeah, are, you, are, are you thrilled to be alive? <laughs> These days, it's pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> life, is, life is exquisite, uh, I have to say. Uh, yeah. far, far beyond what I would have imagined my life was going to be. Yeah. Very cool. Very nice. And Ilan? Jake, you know, the, I came up with this answer when I was in Columbia. I was like, if I felt any better, you'd have to slice me up and sell me. <laughs> um, and again I, look i mean you you heard me talk about here you know uh i triggered myself around my kids i trigger myself around my wife i trigger myself around guy although rarely today i mean we used to have like blowouts where we used to just like hang up fuck you fuck you the, the whole thing um so with all that being said I think it goes back to where this whole conversation started. My appreciation for being alive, it is by far the highest it's ever been. Mm. Just, you know, I, I do my meditation practice every morning. And at the end, you know, I just do my like little gratitude thing. 
And I'm just so grateful to be alive. So grateful to have conversations like this and meet people like you. I'm so grateful to be working with the people that we get to work with, uh, be up to what we're doing from traveling the world. Like I, I was solo dad for the weekend. My wife went away, you know, just like stuff that used to be like, Oh God, I got to be with the kids all by myself. You know, I just, I was so appreciative. Like I get them for myself. I don't even have to share with my wife. Like that's how it switched. Yeah, man. It just, um, I'm in awe of how good life can be truly. Well, the, the, the cool part to me is that if things don't go well for a guy and myself, then we can slice you up and sell you. And there you I go. That's what I said. <laughs> Bro, you have my word. I'll try ayahuasca first before I come get you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're going to do that, you should make sure that I'm on ayahuasca too. Oh, that's good. That's good. We'll like, we'll like marinate you in it. We'll yeah, marinate just you in marinate. it. Yeah, we'll smoke you up. It'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jake, such an absolute pleasure to, uh, to share this space and time with you. I mean, truly just brilliant. I, I love what you've added to my life personally and to our listeners live. It was really, really an honor. Yeah. Well, I inspire myself with both of you and uh, that is refreshing for me. So thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Love awesome. it. Um, yeah. Where can people find out about you and what you're doing and how to f live uh, thrilled lives? Yeah, two things. Um, our website is called liveconscious.com. Not live consciously, but live conscious, like the old think different. And then I have a book on Amazon called Get Weird. Uh, and that's kind of the basics for people to get started. It's amazing. <laughs> love that. I love that. Um, and you do some work, just so people know, you do some work with your, your wife as well? Yeah, she and I put on a uh, week-long retreat twice a year. We limit it to 20 people. And the first half is basically how to navigate safety consciousness, how to get really good at it. And the second half is what we've been talking about today, how to move into heart consciousness. We do the next one in New Mexico, I think this summer, and then next winter we'll do one in Mexico on the beach. Awesome. Can, can people find out about that uh, via your website? Yeah, they can find that on Live Conscious. There's a couple of retreats listed there. Awesome. And I'm doing these, uh, I'm doing these 21 day programs that right now they're free because they're beta groups. I've been studying how people respond to this work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a few more of those. I, I would like to be one in one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. I'll let you know. I'm going to start one in a couple of weeks. I'll get you a heads up. Perfect. Brilliant. Yeah. Right. would love to. Yeah. Um, guy, what'd you think? Worthwhile conversation to be in. Yeah. Always. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm extremely inspired, uh, continue to be by the people we meet and making these connection points all over the world, finding out that there's people thinking this way, acting this way, being this way. To me, it just, it's all pointing in one direction. Yeah. So guy, try, try this. Instead of saying I'm extremely inspired, say I inspire myself. I inspire myself. Yeah. Cause you're doing it. Yeah. So you're doing good. it. Yeah. So good. That's a great reminder for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> amazing guys thank you so much for listening okay. um reach out to jake please and we'll see you on the next have it all podcast have an amazing day everyone bye everybody bye bye